Ethel de Kaiser died aged 77, leaving a £250,000 estate and a life spent fighting apartheid. She died intestate and air hunter Hector Birchwood took up her case. We managed to trace uh, maternal heirs to Ethel de Kaiser's estate within about 48 hours of the Bono Acantia list uh, coming out, so it was relatively fast, you might say. But heirs on the paternal side proved to be more difficult. Ethel's father, uh, as far as we knew, was known as Abraham Tarshish. Uh, when we found his death record, uh, we realised that Tarshish was not actually his real name. It was Abramovich. Uh, so he clearly changed his name when he moved from uh, Lithuania into South Africa. In the, the case of Ethel de Kaiser, we had a myriad of problems relating to this particular issue. Ethel's father changed his name when the family sailed from Lithuania to their new home in South Africa in 1926. But to further complicate matters, he had a secular name and a Jewish religious name, which he alternated between during his lifetime. This is something that's actually quite normal uh, within Jewish genealogy. Uh, you have uh, a number of different names that you can use. Uh, you also have lots of migrations. You have uh, individuals uh, changing their names often. Uh, and then uh, also reinventing themselves and moving to new countries. So it, it's always difficult to deal with a Jewish case, particularly one where you're dealing with a family that is on the face of it, uh, well-educated, prominent, and the world is their oyster. They could be anywhere. Ethel's family set up a new home in South Africa, which was in the grip of the apartheid regime. While still at school, Ethel's brother Jack became involved in the fight against the racial segregation laws. I had an older brother who was involved in the anti-apartheid struggle when he was very young and he was getting uh, arrested when he was still at school. I think I became much more aware of the situation in South Africa than I would have done as a white South African because of him. His involvement taught me a great deal. The government wanted to ensure that people lived in separate parts of the country. So they brought in uh, laws which meant that African workers had to have documents about their person at all times, uh, which were called the pass books, which gave them the right to be here or there and had to be produced at any moment. We, we felt we were doing God's own work. We thought we were critical to uh, really one of the most important political matters for the whole world to confront. And so there was always a sense of drama. And we felt we were doing really, really important work. Although the apartheid regime came to an end in Ethel's lifetime, there were still few opportunities for black South Africans. Aware that she could still make a difference, Ethel became involved in the Canon Collins Trust, which provides scholarships for disadvantaged students from South Africa. Ethel was a very, very determined person. She had great stamina and determination. The cause was her life, and she would do anything to improve the conditions of people in Southern Africa. And she worked day and night to achieve that. Trying to raise money for scholarships, helping students. I mean, that was one of the sort of the hidden side to her. Ethel's dedication to the trust continued right up to her death, even as her health was failing. I mean, Ethel could not see life without being director of the trust. And it was a terrible tragedy for her that she was in her 70s, she was in bad health, in and out of hospital, and she couldn't get to grips to the fact that her life was ebbing away and yet the, what she had set out to achieve, there was so much still to be done. I think a will for Ethel uh, clearly indicated death and the end, despite the many pains and, and sufferings in her life. She loved life and she wouldn't have wanted 
it to end and some psychological f feature wouldn't have wanted her to actually sign that will that indicates the end. Whatever her reasons, Ethel's reluctance to sign a will almost led to her £250,000 estate being swallowed up by the Treasury. As well as maternal heirs, Hector had found two more heirs on the paternal side. But owing to Ethel's father's change of name, Hector had a difficult job in proving the case to the government. It took us over a year to get the case accepted simply because of the problems in us being able to find the right documentation to be able to prove that lineage. Hector knew the facts, but it wasn't until he found one crucial piece of evidence that connected Ethel's father's old name with his new identity in South Africa that he could finally prove the case. The shipping records show us that uh, Abraham Tarshish travelled ahead of his family into South Africa trying to establish himself first and then brought his family over two years later. Uh, Ethel de Kaiser came in with her brother um, Jack and their mother in 1928. It was this key evidence that convinced the Treasury to release Ethel's money to her heirs. I'm very happy that her family benefited instead of the government. Ethel's London flat was put up for sale in November 2008. Hector traced six maternal and two paternal heirs who benefited from her estate. But undoubtedly, her greatest legacy was what she achieved for the people of South Africa. Ethel would have wanted to be remembered as useful to South Africa. The fact that over 2,000 students have managed to achieve a university education. This would not have been possible without the work that Ethel did, both in terms of establishing the trust, raising the money, and putting the trust in a position where it could continue to function. To this day, students from Southern Africa are benefiting from Ethel's work. What she did in, in, in her own way to contribute in, in fighting apartheid was incredible and the contribution that uh, the, sc the scholarships are making uh, beyond South Africa, in, in, in Southern Africa, and trying to transform that region is also amazing. It's something that I think will live with us uh, for a very long time.